Chapter 3. The Failure of Both Congress and the States to Properly Maintain the Militia of the Several States. Notwithstanding that the clauses in the original Constitution pertaining th to the militia of the several states, and the Second and Fifth Amendments, all speak with one clear and consistent voice, and notwithstanding that they are all parts of the self-same supreme law of the land, which the senators and representatives in Congress, as well as the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath and affirmation to support. The Constitution's commands remain unfulfilled. Worse yet, notwithstanding that the militia of the several states are the constitutional institutions which, properly organized, would secure we the people's right to keep and bear arms and maximize its political significance and practical efficacy, next to no Americans today know anything about them. The reason for this, Justice Joseph Story pinpointed long ago. Though the importance of a well-regulated militia would seem so undeniable, it cannot be disguised that among the American people there is a growing indifference to any system of militia discipline, and a strong disposition from a sense of its burdens to be rid of all regulations. How it is practicable to keep the people duly armed without some organization it is difficult to see. There is certainly no small danger that indifference may lead to disgust, and disgust to contempt, and thus gradually undermine all the protection intended by the Second Amendment of our National Bill of Rights. Unfortunately, Justice Story's insight into the growing indifference among Americans of his day has proven all too prophetic. For what he recorded only in its beginnings has come to pass in full in modern times, both in respect of the Second Amendment, as, if, as evidenced by the plethora of plainly unconstitutional, quote, gun control statutes on the books at the national, state, and local levels, and also to an even greater degree with respect to militia clauses of the Constitution as evidenced by the way the general government and the states have cordoned off as impotent and useless in the so-called unorganized militia a huge portion of the population, with next to no complaints from anyone. For the prime example, the foundational contemporary congressional statute that purports to deal with the militia is fundamentally flawed. That A. The militia of the United States consists of all able-bodied males at least 17 years of age and under 45 years of age who are or who have made a declaration of intention to become citizens of the United States and of female citizens of the United States who are members of the National Guard. And B. The classes of the militia are 1 the organized militia, which consists of the National Guard and the Naval Militia, and two, the unorganized militia, which consists of the members of the militia who are not members of the National Guard or the Naval Militia. The basic problems here are that first, the Constitution allows for no, quote, militia of the United States at all. In contradistinction to the armies that Congress may raise and support, and the navy that it may provide and maintain, and which Constitution recognizes as the army and the navy of the United States, Congress enjoys no power whatsoever to create such a national militia. These may be employed in the service of the United States, and may be called into the actual service of the United States, but even then they remain the militia of the several states. The constitutional duties they may perform for the general government do not change the constitutional identities as state establishments. Second, as evidenced by some 150 years of pre-constitutional American history, the militia of the several states should be composed today of at least all males from 16 to 60 years of age, not some less inclusive set, and now, with the emancipation of women, 
of some significant portion of their population in appropriate ways, too. Third, the Constitution allows for no dichotomy between organized militia and unorganized militia, but instead mandates that Congress provide for organizing the militia in their entirety, with no exceptions, exclusions, or exclusions express or implied, other than, of course, the types of exemptions allowed under the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts, which are part and parcel of the constitutional definition of militia. And where no exception is made in terms, none will be made by mere implication or construction. The framers knew how to draft legal language that distinguished between a whole and its parts. Indeed, precisely with respect to the militia in that very same clause, they empowered Congress to provide for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. That they extended the power to govern only to such part of the militia, but the power to organize to the militia without any qualification cannot be accidental, but must mean that the power to organize applies to the whole. This makes perfect practical sense because the whole of the militia of the several states should be organized to such uniform national standards that any part of them that may be called forth can be expected to perform its assigned duties adequately. Whereas only that particular part of them, as may be employed in the service of the United States, needs actually to be governed in conformity with those duties when such occasion arises. True enough, until common Americans receive or acquire some organization, arms, discipline, and training, whether by Congress or in default of Congress by the states, or in default of both of them by we the people on our own. We constitute a militia in name only and are not well regulated. Yet even the name itself retains legal significance, because no amount of neglect by Congress or the states can excise the militia of the several states from the Constitution, extinguish the duty of all able-bodied Americans to serve in them, and eliminate the right of the people to keep and bear arms for that purpose. So, unless Congress and the states may destroy the militia's very constitutional status by gutting their practical substance, unorganized militia are a constitutional impossibility. To be sure, the Constitution also empowers Congress to grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water, with no exceptions. Yet for generations, Congress has let this ground lie fallow. Although on superficial examination, these powers may appear anachronistic as part of a program of homeland security designed to protect America's maritime borders in the most comprehensive manner economically feasible, Letters of mark and reprisal might serve uniquely beneficial purposes. In any event, the question of deploying privateers is ultimately for Congress, which has a fiduciary duty to exercise those powers whenever and wherever that exercise is necessary and proper, but otherwise not. Distinguishably, the Second Amendment settles once and for all whether the exercise of Congress's power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia in their entirety is necessary and proper. The Founding Fathers believed the necessity to be of such magnitude that they expressed it in a general conclusion of law applicable to every state, that, quote, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So Congress's duty in that regard, as to the whole of the people, is beyond cavil or evasion. Fourth, although plainly organized, both the National Guard and the Naval Militia, and their state components as well, are not, and constitutionally cannot be, any parts of the militia of the several states, if only because they are not coextensive with we the people as a whole. And fifth, 
Congress has left what it calls the unorganized militia, and the great number of other Americans whom Congress disregards altogether, entirely unorganized, unarmed, undisciplined, and ungoverned by any state of the general government, notwithstanding that Congress's explicit authority and duty in the premises is precisely to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, not to provide against such readiness, or arbitrarily to redefine the militia of the several states so as to exclude millions of individuals. By consigning huge numbers of Americans to the unorganized militia, and regulating others to no militia at all, Congress prevents itself from performing to a satisfactory degree its own vital constitutional duty to provide for the calling forth of the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Because these tens of millions of Americans are wholly unprepared to be called forth, with the organization, arms, and discipline necessary to perform those functions. And if so many individuals, eligible for and constitutionally required to serve in the militia, remain unorganized, unarmed, and undisciplined, then the president, as the commander-in-chief of the militia of the several states, when called into the actual service of the United States, cannot satisfactorily exercise his constitutional power and perform his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed in those situations when and where a significant portion of the true constitutional militia ought to be called forth to execute the laws of the Union. So by stripping the president of the means to, of the means to employ and fulfill his constitutional power and duty, Congress violates its own duty to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution all powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any officer thereof. Perhaps, though, citation of these untoward consequences merely brings owls to Athens. For inasmuch as affirmative words are often in their operation, negative of other objects than those affirmed, the explicit constitutional power of Congress to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia absolutely precludes Congress's exercise of any imaginary contradictory power, either to leave any part of the militia of the several states unorganized, unarmed, or undisciplined, or to refuse to make any and all laws necessary and proper for preparing the militia of the several states for the service of the United States. Thus, on the very face of the Constitution, the, quote, unorganized militia is an oxymoron. On the other hand, a statute should be construed in a constitutional manner whenever possible. On that basis, Congress's definitions of the militia of the several <clears throat> Congress's definitions of the militia of the United States and the quote unorganized and the quote organized militia could be taken to amount to nothing more than other, albeit inaccurate and confusing names for the National Guard and Naval Militia, which would mean, however, that the general government's so-called unorganized militia is simply a wastebasket term for all individuals of certain ages who are not members of those establishments, and that therefore the true militia of the several states finds no place at all in the national statutory corpus juris. So as to them, Congress's default in its duty is one of omission rather than commission. The states, too, leave largely untapped the vast pool of manpower 
available for their militia, notwithstanding that they enjoy a reserved authority concurrent with that of Congress, as well as labor under a duty, in the absence of sufficient action by Congress, to organize, arm, discipline, govern, and train their own militia to the fullest extent the Constitution intends. For example, the Constitution of Virginia provides that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense for a free state. Therefore, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That standing armies in times of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Even more emphatically than the Second Amendment, this article identifies a well-regulated militia as the proper natural, and safe defense of a free state, and defines the state's, quote, well-regulated militia as consisting of essentially everyone in the body of the people, all of them not only enjoying a right to keep and bear arms, but also being appropriately trained to arms. In this, Virginia's constitution parallels the original constitution of the United States which reserves to the states, respectively, the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. <clears throat> Nonetheless, according to a contemporary Virginia statute, the militia of the Commonwealth of Virginia shall consist of all able-bodied citizens of this Commonwealth and all other able-bodied persons resident in this commonwealth who have declared their intention to become citizens of the United States, who are at least 16 years of age, and with certain statutory exceptions, not more than 55 years of age. The militia shall be divided into four classes. The National Guard, which includes the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard, the Virginia State Defense Force, the Naval Militia, and the unorganized militia. The Virginia National Guard and Naval Militia are adjuncts of the Army, Air Force, and Navy of the United States, and the Virginia State Defense Force is merely a tiny appendage of and supplement to the Commonwealth's National Guard, specially authorized by congressional statute, as it must be to meet congressional muster. The Army Air Force and Navy of the United States are quite distinct from the militia of the several states, though. Everyone else in the Commonwealth, including the vast majority of her population of able-bodied persons, not specially exempted by statute from service in the militia, is consigned willy-nilly to what Virginia Code calls the, quote, unorganized militia. According to the statute, the unorganized militia shall consist of all able-bodied persons, except such as may be included in the National Guard, the Naval Militia, and the Virginia State Defense Force, and except such as may be exempted. Thus, although in incorporating the militia of the several states into its federal structure, the Constitution makes no differentiation whatsoever between organized and unorganized militia, but instead empowers Congress to provide for organizing the militia as a whole, with no license to make any such distinction. And although the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, to which the laws of every state must conform, nevertheless, Virginia has created a class of supposed, quote, militia, with no constitutional justification and consigned the vast majority of her citizens to it. The fact that Congress violates the Constitution licenses no state to follow in its wayward footsteps. For when the meaning and scope of a constitutional provision are clear, it cannot be overthrown by legislative action, although several times repeated and never before challenged.
Now, under a power similar to, but broader than that enjoyed by Congress, the governor of Virginia may call forth the militia or any part thereof to state active duty for service in any of the following circumstances. 1. In the event of invasion or insurrection or intimate threat of either 2. When any combination of persons becomes so powerful as to obstruct the execution of laws in any part of this commonwealth. Or 3. When the governor determines that a state agency or agencies having law enforcement responsibilities are in need of assistance. 4. In the event of flood, hurricane, fire, or other forms of natural or man-made disaster, wherein human life, public or private property, or the environment is imperiled. 5. In emergencies including but not limited to the disruption of pi vital public services, wherein the use of militia personnel or equipment would be, of si would be of assistance to one or more departments, agencies, institutions, or political subdivisions of the Commonwealth. 6. When the Governor determines that the National Guard and its assets would be valuable assistance to state, local, or federal agencies having a drug law enforcement function to combat the flow or use of illegal drugs in the Commonwealth. With a few additions, such as a paragraph dealing expressly with the apprehension of illegal, of illegal aliens and those persons aiding, abetting, and exploiting them, this would, constitute an excellent, this would constitute an excellent foundation for a catalog of the essential functions of the militia of the several states when revitalized in every state. Yet to perform any of these duties, Virginia's unorganized militia is substantially, if not totally, unprepared. Virginia law does provide for the training and administration of the National Guard and State Defense Force, and does require the members of the National Guard and the State Defense Force to attend such training when scheduled. But the Commonwealth's unorganized militia has no training program of its own, and becomes an integral part of Virginia State Defense Force only if and when the governor orders out the unorganized militia. So, training of the unorganized militia will at best be happenstance. In any event, whatever training Virginia's unorganized militia may receive does not include regular or substantial familiarization with firearms and their use, inasmuch as even, quote, members of the Virginia State Defense shall not be armed with firearms during the performance of training duty or state active duty, except under such circumstances and in instances authorized by the governor. That alone differentiates the Virginia State Defense Force and the Commonwealth's, quote, unorganized militia from every pre-constitutional colonial and state militia, in which almost every adult able-bodied free male was required by law to possess in his own home and regularly to train with a firearm, with neither let nor hindrance from the governor or any other public official. Thus, Virginia law itself establishes with legal historical certainty that the Virginia State Defense Force and all of Commonwealth's unorganized militia are not constitutional militia at all. In sum, Congress does not provide for arming most Virginians, and in default of congressional action, Virginia herself does not provide for arming them, but instead prescribes that they, quote, shall not be armed with firearms during the performance of training duty or state active duty, except under circumstances and in instances authorized by the governor. On both counts, this situation is plainly at odds with what the Constitution requires. Perhaps, though, no one should be too surprised at Virginia's failure in this regard, in light of other palpably unconstitutional provisions on the same subject matter lurking within her code. For instance, one Virginia statute declares that, quote, in time of peace, the Commonwealth shall maintain only such troops as may be authorized by the President of the United States. Whereas, the Constitution of the United States provides that, quote, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, keep troops in time of peace. 
Another Virginia statute mandates that in the event of certain exigent circumstances within a country, city, or town of the Commonwealth, either the governing body or the chief law enforcement officer may call upon the governor for assistance from the militia. The governor may call forth the militia or any part thereof to provide such assistance as he may deem proper in responding to such circumstances. But in all instances, the militia shall remain subject to military command and not to civilian authorities of the country, city, or town receiving assistance. Virginia's own constitution, however, provides that in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Perhaps in this case, though, the governor constitutes the civil power, notwithstanding that he is also commander-in-chief of the Commonwealth's militia. Even if so, the constitutionally more prudent practice would be to avoid subjecting local officials to, quote, military command, even through the governor, by instead recognizing their at least concurrent authority under such circumstances to supervise the militia's activity on their behalf. In any event, where the Commonwealth's militia is concerned, apparently neither the Constitution of the United States nor the Constitution of Virginia is very well understood by, is treated as binding upon, or even means much to Virginia's legislators. On the other hand, Virginia Code does not recognize, albeit only partially and in doubt and no doubt inadvertently, the Commonwealth's reserved power to organize her own constitutional militia whenever Congress neglects, fails, or refuses to do so properly. As explained above, Congress now includes within what, what it labels the unorganized militia only able-bodied males at least 17 years of age and under 45 years of age. As explained above, Congress now includes within what it labels the unorganized militia only able-bodied males at least 17 years of age and under 45 years of age, whereas Virginia includes within her so-called unorganized militia able-bodied persons at least 16 years of age and not more than 55 years of age. So Virginia expands the composition of our unorganized militia by 11 classes of eligible individuals more than Congress enlists, and by presumably enrolling women as well as men thus bringing Virginia's unorganized militia far closer to the typical standards as to ages under the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts than what Congress requires, as well as enlarging its membership in conformity with the steady emancipation of women since the late 1700s, and thereby more closely approximating what should be the present constitutional norm for the composition of one of the militia of the several states. This exception aside, however, general ignorance and insouciance on the part of public officials with respect to the militia of the several states remains endemic not only in Virginia, but also throughout every other state, as well as the general government. This situation is especially shocking, unconscionable, and intolerable in light of the Constitution's purpose to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, the power and duty of Congress to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, the duty of the United States to guarantee to every state in this Union a Republican form of government, and to protect each of them against invasion, and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence. And the principle that the police power of a state springs from the obligation of the state to protect its citizens and provide for the safety and good order of society. Apparently, nonetheless, it is also irremediable. So long as Americans depend solely upon members of Congress, the several states' legislatures, careerist politicians, and the major political parties to understand, let alone do, what is required on their own initiatives, by their own lights, and in service of any purpose higher than their own narrow self-interests.
End of chapter 3.